Well, good morning. You know, you're, you're, you're tougher than I thought. I, I expected because it was cold today and, you know, people in San Antonio are not used to that and that uh, it was wet on top of that, that you'd all stay home. I don't know. But we greet you and we're so thankful so many are here this morning. And we also know that we're talking to folks at home or somewhere that are live streaming as well. And so we greet you as well, and we're thankful that we can be together. And we need encouragement in God's Word. I think that was alluded to by what was just prayed by Tom, and uh, uh, I need it, and you need it. And one thing about the, the Christian, our focus is not on our circumstances. Our focus is on our God and the promises of His Word and the instruction from his word that keeps us on target, that we might walk in a way that is pleasing to him. And speaking of that, we're in Ephesians, as you know, and we are now finding ourselves in chapter 5. And the chapter 5 follows chapter 4, <laughs> which follows chapters 1 through 3, which had to do with some tremendous doctrine that is most necessary and very revealing. And, and so what we're studying now that begin in chapter 4 is clear commandments, instruction, but with commandments from God on how we are to conduct ourselves, how we are to think, how we are to be, and how we are to do. And as usual in Paul's instructions, in order to understand that, what he does is he gives us contrast. And so we are not only told what we are to be and do, but we are told what we are not to be and what we are not to do. And in this particular section that we're in, uh, these first five verses of chapter five are an introduction in more detail to follow in verses 6 through 21 of what I would call a personal section. And, it, and it, the theme of this is imitating God, building off of really verse 4-1 where we are to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And of course, walk has to do with how we live our lives. It's a picture of a pathway, a journey that each one of us is on in this life. And it's very important that as Christians, we're not here to live for ourselves or for the world system or, or anything like that. We're, we're here to live for, as Paul said, for me to live as Christ. So let me ask the Lord again just to help us to study this very important portion of Scripture, very apropos for what's going on in our world around us, that we stay fixed, fixed on Him. Let me pray. Father, thank You for Your precious, holy Word. Thy Word is truth. Oh, bless us today again. Feed us from your word that, Father, that we would uh, have the very mind of Christ and that we would love you more, that we would find more confidence in you, that we would be strengthened in our faith, that we would be edified to leave here and to go out and be a witness, to be a light, to be useful. And Father, that we'd be steadfast and immovable in everything that we do because we have fed ourselves upon your truth, which is so significant and needful in every one of our lives. Please help me to speak today and glorify your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're in chapter 5 and verse 1, and the first thing we read there is, Therefore... Be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, 
we have been studying under Glenn Conrad about the importance of being made in the image of God. And you'll notice here that he says, and I'm going to pick up the end to start with here, the end of verse 1, he says, as beloved children. And as beloved children, that indicates that there is a direct attachment to the Almighty God. The Almighty God being made in His image. And so, this is being fulfilled, in other words, this idea of being made in the image of God is really being fulfilled only in Christians by the restoration of the relationship between man and God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So allow me to make some serious fundamental declarations from Scripture. There are many, and we can't go there today, we spend all our time there, but there are many theological theories about what it means to be made in the image of God. And obviously it means that we represent God, but how we represent God, some have that to be in a moral sense, others in a fact that we are creative. The animals aren't creative. We are creative. We have wills, which the animals do not have. And it is found in Genesis 1 in the context of rulership. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the sky and so forth and so on, which logically begins with ability, if that be the case, that we must rule ourselves as well. For if we can't rule ourselves in that sense, now we know that our rulership is from God, then we cannot rule anything else, can we? Flip back with me to Ephesians chapter 2 just for a moment. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. When we're looking at verse 1 to 3, so very important to understand the foundation of where each one of us begins. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. That means no life. No spiritual life. In which you formerly walked, what? According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working. Notice, in the sons of disobedience. Among them too we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We see this condition expressed by not being ruled or ruling as God would have us to rule, or not even ruling ourselves. Because he says here that we are in our natural unsaved state, we are moving or walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the, the spirit working in the sons of disobedience. We are being ruled over and living according to the evil one, the God of this world that is declared otherwise in Scripture. And so therefore, this image of God is certainly not here, is it? In that sense. That sense that we're not representing God, we are not being, we're not even ruling ourselves, not alone, anything else in any kind of a justifiable state at all. And so in Jesus Christ, though, this image is restored. We think of 1 John 3, 2, that when we see him, what? We will be like him. We will be like him. And what does God tell us about Jesus Christ? All authority has been given him in both heaven and earth. All authority has been given him. Matthew 28. How wonderful that is. So it is restored in Jesus Christ. Now look back with me at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, He predestined us to adoption 
as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Here is the beginning of this chain of events that leads to our walk with him theologically and begin before eternity in the past, and he adopted us as sons. The word adopted here as sons, or, or could be uh, translated children of, of him, is a word I can't even pronounce in the Greek, so I'm not going to try, but it's a big word, okay? And the placement of a child by adoption, it's a legal term, is an act of grace whereby children became adopted sons of God, legally entering His family. How wonderful. How wonderful. But, flip back over to chapter 5 and verse 1, where he says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children here. This is a different word. Now, I can pronounce this one in the Greek. It's technon, okay? <laughs> Technon in the Greek, and it's used in Scripture of a child that is produced naturally by natural birth. Not adoption, but by natural birth. Now, my point is, something has happened here, you see. From the time he adopted us as children before the foundation of the world... And we move through what he did theologically for us. And then we're in chapter 2 and we look at verse 4 and 5 there where it says, But God made us alive. And then by grace are you saved through faith. He, he's, we're born again, you see. This is the new birth. And that's what this is focusing on. He is describing us beginning in chapter 5 and verse 1, and this beloved, which is also very special, children of God, as now sharing in God's nature. As children produced of Him in a natural sense, after His very nature. And well, that's a big deal. If any man be in Christ... 2 Corinthians 5.17 should be one of your favorite verses. He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. We have a new heart, a new nature. A nature, it's still developing and uh, off of that foundation because we're not perfect yet and we won't be until we're glorified, but it's going to be a nature that will live in His presence as His beloved children eternally. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we are transformed by the new birth. And so this is key to seeing the contrast that we're going to see in this passage in verses 1 and 2 are focusing on what we should be as in the image of God versus what we will see when we get down to verse, well, it really it starts in verse 3, but it's defined in verse 6 where it says at the end of verse 6, sons of disobedience. Now, you see the two categories there? Beloved children of God, and we could even call them sons of obedience, by, with his nature, are sons of disobedience. There's the contrast that Paul brings, and that is very important in the exercising then of our new nature, a nature which is consistent with who we are in relation to God, the holy God of glory. All right, so now with that, let's go to verse 1 of chapter 5. Back to it. He says, therefore be imitators of God. Therefore refers back, of course, to chapter 4, verse 1, and uh, where we are to walk worthy of the calling for which we have been called. That's where it starts. And all of this is about how we walk, how we live, based on what God has done. But he says here this very important general sense of who we are to be. He says, 
we are to be imitators of God. Now, the Greek word imitator is mimetis, which is meant where we get the word mimic. We are to mimic God. We think of we are to copy what he is like, and we can only do that when we are these beloved children of his with this new nature. I hope you're following me. But it's very important to see this. Now, you may say, well, that sounds a little strange. Does it really? Look back with me at John, Gospel of John, in chapter 5. John chapter 5, and let's track with the God, man, Savior, the incarnation. Remember that God in Christ, Christ was fully God, but he was also fully man. Look at chapter 5 and verse 19. There's this statement made by Christ himself. And by the way, it was repeated in many ways. He says, therefore Jesus... Well, let me back up to verse 18 to put, to put us in the context. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. They, they knew what, what he was proclaiming, and some people in the cults today still don't figure that out, but there it is very clearly, right? Okay, verse 19. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself. Now He's speaking here as a man. As a man. And He says, can do nothing of Himself unless it is something, notice this, He sees the Father doing. There's mimic. Brother, He's been with the Father. He talks about that in John 17, doesn't He? That the, the glory I had with you before the world began. He's been in the presence of Almighty God. He is mimicking the very life of God. That's why later he would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He mimics God his Father in everything he does. It's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever, notice this, the Father does... These things the Son also does in like manner. Isn't that wonderful? Well, guess what? According to what Paul just told us, we are beloved children, even by nature, of God. And so, just like Christ, who set that example, we are to do the same thing. Going back to Ephesians, keep your finger there and go over to 1 Peter, and you see this, cons this consistent theme throughout the Word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says the same thing. Look at verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14 of 1 Peter. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust in which were yours in ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, notice, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. And why? Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's mimicking, imitating God our Father as His beloved children. So here we are. And, and, my, and may I say, and I always come to mind the, uh, one of my favorite passages in Romans that is so telling, Romans 8, where, uh, he, where Paul begins in 829, that those whom God foreknew, that's that unbroken chain, it says he predestined, what? To become conformed to the image of his son. See, it's the same thing. You see this consistent theme that runs with such great importance throughout God's Word. Now, he tells us then, beginning, what is the, the, the foundation of what he means by imitating God? And this foundation is built, and then he's going to move into particulars from that foundation, but he begins in verse 2, to tell us, and he says, 
and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now, love is the predominant characteristic of God. Now, it's not all that God is, but we think of 1 John 4, 8. It says God is love. It sums him up as love. And he tells us even here that what that means to walk in love because he says, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. In other words, love is defined by Christ, right? We look at God, as Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and we understand what love, the love of God for his own is like. What did Christ do? He gave himself, and he gave himself sacrificially and completely. There was no hidden agenda, no gimmick, uh, no nothing of a selfish nature whatsoever. In fact, if you want to look at it, the giving of his love in such a way is really unreasonable. Paul talks about this in Romans 5, in that while we were yet sinners, nothing pretty about us, no offense to you but not, or me, we're just, that's just the facts of life. We're ugly. We were enemies of God. Christ died for us. He died for the unlovely. He died for people that deserve his wrath and going to hell. That's the glory of this, you see. Now, he says here that we're to have this same kind of love. Before God, sacrificially, and before each other, sacrificially, we are to have this same sense of giving of ourselves, not for ourselves like the world does. Everything is about me, 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 me but giving ourselves on behalf of our God and on behalf of one another sacrificially so that you become more important than me. Isn't that what Christ did? That's what Christ did. He gave himself. And by the way, this kind of love features with it Forgiveness. I said at the initiation, if you look at the last thing said before he says, therefore, at 5.1, if you look at 4.32, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And a big feature of this love is that we forgive each other. And it's not just a one-time deal. And it's not just something we do with our teeth gritted. Oh, okay, I'll forgive you. It means from the heart that we forgive each other and we continually forgive each other because that's exactly what Christ does, right? Greater love has no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. You see, we're all... A bunch of burrs. You know what a burr is? A sticker? I used to call them sticker when I was a kid. I got them in my feet because I went around barefooted all the time. And we rub each other wrong. Continually. Even some of you that I love the most. Sometimes you rub me wrong and I know I rub you wrong. It's kind of hard to believe, you know, but that's the way it is. Sometimes I rub Jan wrong. And she puts up with me, but I'm thankful for that, believe me. And we forgive each other. And we move on because it really doesn't matter how we irritate one another or rub each other wrong because it is nothing compared to the offenses that we have against the holy God. He sacrificed himself and he forgives us over and over and over and I could keep going until we you know we'd stand here until 12 o'clock just talking about over and over and over and over and over because that is what love a big ingredient a big part of what love is all about so loving 
like Christ, will always include this continual forgiveness. And because it is bottom line in the best interest of others. Now I'm just going to say as an aside that I have known people in my Christian experience that really have their doctrines nailed down. Boy, they're, they're just got to, their head is expanded with all kinds of information about God and understanding of the Scripture and all that. But they're loveless of people. Have you run into people like that? So that's a dangerous thing. There's no such thing, by the, by the way, as a loveless Christian. Be careful about this. We're to be imitators of God. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? There's nothing more valuable. And believe me, I'm understanding it more all the time than a beloved son. And God gave His beloved Son. And He says here, a, and, let's see, He gave Himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now you know, in fact, this was talked about this morning by Tyler. The, the, the Old Testament is filled with pictures of what it means to know God and to walk with God and live for God. And so there were these offerings in the Old Testament. And if we took the time to go to Leviticus chapter 1, where you have the burnt offerings, which depicted Christ giving himself in his total devotion to that's what those sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But if you study that passage in Leviticus chapter 1, one of the things that you'll see is that it's talking about entrails. Bloody, gory, ugly insides. And how they're to be burned. And ironically, when they are burned, it becomes this sweet aroma, this fragrant aroma to God. Isn't that weird? Well, what do you think that is? That's a picture of the fact of how ugly our sins are. This blood and gore and the insides and the entrails and all of that show us the ugliness of our sin. And yet when it's sacrificed to God, it becomes a fragrant Aroma, it's a picture of how that is transformed to something that is good or pleasing to God Himself. Now, that's not the only offering. There's meal offerings and there's peace offerings. And each one of those is a different aspect of who Jesus Christ and what He did in His coming to die on Calvary's cross. But this... Soothing aroma is a picture for us of the ugliness of our sin replaced by this obedience to God. And by the way, in that formative era, that covenant relationship that Israel had with Jehovah God, nothing would replace those sacrifices. Israel got tired of them. You get to Malachi, and the Lord says, just shut the, just shut the door. They got tired of doing it, and it was a bloody mess, and they got tired of all that mess, and it just got weary, and their heart wasn't right about it, and they didn't care about it, and they tried other things to please God. They, they, they tried to pacify God, and they tried to pacify other gods. They got into idolatry and all manner of things, but there is nothing, you see, that would replace those prescribed, commanded sacrifices for Israel, and there is nothing today in that picture that can replace you and me being a living sacrifice for God. Do you follow me? We have to be imitators of God. And 
You see, he says that our sacrifice today is what? Walk in love. Just like Jesus Christ walked in love and even walked to the cross and freely gave himself on behalf of us. Now, he's going to contrast this beginning in verse 3 with the children of disobedience that are spoken of down in verse 6, where he says in the last part of that, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So beginning in verse 3, he shows what is the child of, of disobedience. So here's this contrast, beloved children of God with this new nature versus the child of disobedience with their self-centered vices, which is the opposite of what he is spelling as imitators of God. Now, these are Satan's sons. All unsaved are not walking in love by considering others, even if there is in some form of religion. Really doesn't matter. This is, this is a significant and real Contrast, and what does he say, beginning in verse 3? But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Uh, saints. Here are the two vices first mentioned, immorality and impurity. Because the devil's form of love is lust. It's lustful, self-indulgent perversion. Immorality is that word in the Greek, pornea, which we get our word pornography. A reference to all sexual sin. Sin not of true love, not formed in family relations, not formed in dignity, the dignity of man that's supposed to be made in the image of God, and in holy matrimony. And, and, and so the excuse today is that, well, that's just people being people. Just people being people. But it can't be because it mars the image of of God, please see that. You know, God's standards don't change just because the, the society's standards change and they are tried to be forced down our neck. In fact, they do that and claim that when we have standards that follow this precious word, that we're just unloving. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's not love. That's not love at all. Lack of self-control or failure to be obedient to God leads to a perversion of relationships and it is not fixed in concern for others. Because my greatest concern for you and your greatest concern for me should be our relationship to God and we are to be imitators of God, right? Not imitators of Satan, who wants to pervert everything that is just and righteous and holy. And the influence of the lustful world has been so pervasive, it has moved into the church, and many people who claim Christ have become convinced that such behaviors are well, they're just covered by grace because I'm saved by grace. And so they, they think that they are morally safe by evolving with the acceptable things of the culture. Not so. What does God declare here? He says, must not even be named among you. In other words, he's, he's putting it out there 
in such a way that don't get close to it. Don't, don't even get on the fringes of it. You'll get burned. It should never under any circumstances exist among Christians. Nothing could be made clearer than this by the very language that is expressed here. Amen? Amen. Now many testimonies have been ruined by this kind of theology of thinking that the grace of God can be turned into a license for the flesh, and that's really what Jude talks about, and, and it's found in other places like Romans 6. Uh, you know, it, it, this can't be. We, we recently had a scandal in a, in a major Christian university. Terrible things. Oh, and the world just relishes in, the, in that, don't they? Look at that hypocrisy, you see. <laughs> you tell us. You follow God. Look what you, you're just like us. Shame, shame, shame. It brings shame and disgrace. And when forbidden activities are condoned or participated, ruin by a Christian, ruin and destruction takes place. It's wretched and it's ugly and nothing good can come from that. Nothing. And so it's a warning. And I, I think particularly of young people. Don't evolve. Oh, and the culture is terrible today. Don't evolve with the culture. Have your mind and heart fixed in God's Word. That's the, the essential nature of why God tells us to meet and to study to show ourselves approved and to continuously be in the Word. Like newborn babes, we are to hunger and thirst after the Word of God in every sense of the Word. Because of the, it has to be so in order for us to combat all of the pressure and wiles of the devil that trick and seek to, to confuse us and trouble us and make us compromise our imitating of God. All right, verse 4. Notice what he says. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now, <laughs> boy, there's a whole lot to, to be said here. But the idea of filthiness is that which is obscene or indecent conversation Literally, that which is shameful or deformed. Much of the world's conversation is found here, isn't it? You, we, we think, obviously, of the amount of profanity that goes on from people's lips. But it's not just that. It's a, it's a whole attitude issue. And, and we are constantly, each one of us, conversing with others. We have to do that. And we're thankful to do that. But we engage others... And we are always to be in our mind imitating God before others because we are His ambassadors for Christ, as He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We represent Him before others. And here He even says, silly talk. And this word in the Greek is morologia. In case you get, can't figure that out, that the word we get more on. It's talk that is senseless. It's not useful to instruct, edify, or profit. And, and so the world not only engages in this profane conversation, but they engage in meaningless conversation. It's like what is discussed in Ecclesiastes about futility. Man is engaged in Futility, it's like striving after the air, the wind. It just, it means nothing. You could, you could take all of that silly talk and put it in a thimble and it means nothing. It doesn't even fill a thimble. It has no value to it. And when we think of that, look, look down in chapter 5 of Ephesians, down to verse 15, which... I think is a theme verse for this whole section. He says, therefore, be careful how you walk, 
not as unwise men, but as wise, notice, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. And he says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And that's what he's giving us here, isn't he? Be imitators of God. Fill your conversation with that which is good. That which glorifies God. That which is becoming a child of the living God. Now this word back in our text here, he says, filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting. I think there doesn't need to be a lot of explanation for time here. But the idea not fitting, it means it does not become the character of a Christian. And by the way, this is what the world fills their life with. I, I have, you know, in, in my uh, let my hair down moments or whatever you want to call them, I try to watch the, I've tried to watch TV sitcoms, and I, I just can't stand it. It is just the, the attitude, the base attitude of all of that garbage and junk and filth is evil. It's not funny. That that's the world's idea of fun, unfunny, Lord, help us. There's just, it's just sick. It's demeaning. It's terrible. Oh, we need to be careful what our children watch and what our children see. I think even some of those cartoons are filled with an attitude that is developing a self-centered, overindulgent, me-all, me-everything mindset for our children. That's not what we're here for at all. Now, Christians should be apart from this, and that's what he's saying. Now, at the same time, I say this doesn't condemn fun. Do we understand that? You remember that Christ's first miracle was at the wedding feast at Cana. They weren't all sitting around looking like sad sack at the wedding feast at Cana. They were rejoicing in, in what God had provided in marriage that two people in love were coming together and they were having incredible joy in that. You know, the, over the, the door out here, it says, this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Now that's fun. That's joy. In the, in, the, uh, in the presence of God is the fullness of joy forevermore. There'll never be a greater joy than we're in heaven with Him. And you look at that in Revelation chapter 5 and we're singing that new song to Him. Now you want to talk about joy, it, make, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. That's joy, but it's not associated with evil and rottenness and filth and and a wrong mentality about things and life and God and everything else. That's not fun. That's not joy at all. And he says here, he even explains to us, what should our demeanor be? But rather giving of thanks. Boy, now that's a rarity, isn't it? Have you been listening to what people are saying? Just it, And it goes on continuously. I don't care if it, you walk up on some men working somewhere or somebody else. Complain, complain, complain. And usually with a bunch of explicitives, you know, to go with it. And all of the sourness and ugliness and, and griping and carrying on. This ain't right and that ain't right. And, he, you know, and we go on and on. And that can come into the church house. What are we supposed to do? This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Is everything going my way? No. But it's the day He's made, and I'll, I'll trust Him. I'll trust Him. Does He know what He's doing? Yes, He does. Is everything going to turn out all right for those that love Him and trust in Him? Yes, they are. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice. It has a purpose. He works all things together for good to them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Amen? Amen. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. 
I miss him, but I'll use his name since he's not here and I can't embarrass him anyway. Paul O'Dell, who went to be with the Lord this last year. You got around him, and he was thankful to God every day, even though he was limping along and falling down and all kinds of other problems and issues. And it was a pleasure to be in his presence. That's fun. That's joy. Rather, he says, the giving of thanks. And when we get to verse 5, this is a very sobering statement in this general uh, introduction here to the, to the verses that will follow going through verse 21 about our personal walk with God. And he soberly reminds us here. He says, for this you know with what? Maybe yes, maybe no. With certainty. This you know with certainty. That no immoral or impure person or covetous person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Well now, wait a minute. I thought I was saved by grace. And that grace covers a multitude of sins. Well, it does. Thank the Lord it does because none of us would be able to be here and, 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 and claim Christ at all. But at the same time, there's something different about this, you see, and it reflects back to 5.1, beloved children, and what that children means in technon, as children by nature of God, we have a nature change, and as a result of that, we want to act or imitate our Father and not imitate a Satan whom we naturally would imitate from the time we were born, born dead in trespasses and sin, according to the prince of the power of the air. You see that difference there? I hope you see it. Persons living in sin, no matter their profession, he says, are not and will not be in God's kingdom. I can tell you emphatically right now that nothing is, is as, as important as being in God's kingdom. This world is just passing. It's going to be gone for, for every one of us here. Just we're a heartbeat away. And if we're not right with God, if we're not imitating Him because He has worked in our heart, He says with certainty, your inheritance is not with Him. Please mark that down because... There are many churches and many theologians that make no distinction between children of God and the children of disobedience. They have made it some sort of a rote thing where if somebody has made a profession of Christ in some sense, in some time, in some way, and entered the church door of some church somewhere, some way, they are all right with God. May I remind you of Matthew 7, 21, the Sermon on the Mount again, where Jesus Christ comes to the end and says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Right? Doesn't that pretty well define it? That's imitators. That's imitators of God. Paul talks to the Corinthian church. I won't for time go there. The Corinthian church was a big, fat mess. Rambunctious, troublesome bunch of people. And he tells them in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, do not be deceived. And he gives a list of those that are of the major sins, the very kind of things that we're talking about here. And he says, these will, if you're practicing these things, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And he even goes on to say, and such were, past tense, some of you. But you've been changed. You've been washed. 
See, it's very important to understand that how we are as a person, how we're living and thinking and doing defines whether or not we have that kind of relationship with God. That's what he's saying. It's not something we can drum up. It has to come from the inside out. That's why a person has to repent. That's why a person has to turn. That's why a person has to truly call upon God. Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Change me. Make me like your son. All of that is so very, very important. He says here, No immoral or impure person or covetous man who's an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And so in other words, don't even get in the same closeness at all to any of that junk. Remember before in chapter 4 he talked about put those things away and put on the new self. And that's our responsibility, working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, as he tells us in Philippians 2.12. We each have to do that. It's a struggle in life to please him. In closing, go with me again to 1 John chapter 3, where John deals with this throughout this 1 John epistle. And it's so very important to know this. 1 John chapter 3, look at verse 9. He says, 1 John 3, 9, No one who is born of God does what? Practices sin. Now, does that mean he's sin-free? No. He covers that in the first chapter of 1 John. In fact, if we say we're sin-free, we make God out to be a liar. But he's talking here about practicing sin as a lifestyle, a consumption, a consuming in sin. If my heart is not changed, if I am not imitating or seeking to imitate God in my life, there is something wrong. You're just playing religion. That's what he's saying here. No one who is born of God practices sin. Why? Because his seed abides in him. That's the Holy Spirit. And he cannot sin because, why? He is born of God. Now, cannot sin means cannot practice sin. He can't just indulge himself like the world does, consumed with sin at every turn. As it says in Genesis chapter 6, before God destroyed the earth by the flood, every thought and intention of man's heart was on evil continually. Beloved, we are in that last day's perilous times where we are seeing that all around us and we are to be imitators of God as Noah was in his time. That's what we're called to do, to be light and salt and he says, by the way, in chapter 3 of 1 John in verse 10, he says, by this, notice, by this the children of God, there we go again, that's the same thing he starts with in Ephesians 5.1, by this the children of God and the children of the devil, which are the children of disobedience, are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. And notice he brings in love, just like we did in our text in Ephesians 5, nor the one who does not love his brother. Isn't it amazing how consistent this word is? Written over 1,600 years with all these different authors, <laughs> and they all say they come back because it's written of God by the Holy Spirit. It's an illumination to us. It tells us the truth of the righteous, holy, consistent God. Well, we've been instructed here. We've been instructed. 
And so God has graciously mapped out what it means to be imitators of God, and this is just the start. And He's helped us to soberly reflect on this as we sit. Well, you're sitting, I'm standing, but as we sit in the midst of a very dark world. What are we supposed to do? Here's the will of God. Isn't this the will of God? Just like Christ said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. It's the same thing with us. This is the will of God. That you be imitators of God. Bow with me please in prayer. Father, we are so very grateful that you have given us clear instruction. It's no wonder that it's said that your word it pierces like a sword into the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and every thought and intention of the heart. And that's what we need. We need heart surgery. Lord, help each one of us, Father, to imitate you because we're born again. Oh, how wonderful it is to know you and make us ever thankful, Father. Oh, and, and touch our lips like you touched Isaiah's lips, Father, that we might speak in joy and righteousness before you and the things that we do, that we would encourage people to know you and know the truth in the midst of this dark world. Give us the strength that we need. Thank you for the instruction. We praise you for all of your kindnesses to us. In Jesus' name, amen.